Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast. My name is Nathan Sutherland, and this podcast is dedicated to helping families love God and use tech. If you are familiar with us, then you know that Gospel Tech is part of Flint and Iron, a nonprofit Anna and I started a couple years ago to spark positive purpose in youth. And if you're not, now you do. Um, we are excited to have you all here today, and today's conversation is specifically going to continue on last week's conversation, which was, how do I know if my tech use is healthy? This week, we're going to say, all right, well, I know if it is or isn't, but now what do I do with that? How do we move forward into 2021 to have healthy tech? And really, our focus this week, as it is every week, isn't really how do we how do we control our tech or how do we even use tech better, but it's how do we connect our hearts to the truth of the gospel? Right? The gospel is that the good news that God saves sinners and that that has been done in Christ. So in light of a work that's already been done, but it's not showing up in my heart yet, and now it's acting out through my pursuit of work or my pursuit of escape or my pursuit of lashing out at others emotionally online, what do I do? What does the gospel say I need to do about that with my tech? And today we get to get into some of that, like some really practical, like there is actually a do of the gospel. It's not just kind of theory and I don't know, smoke and mirrors. Like there's actually a God who actually changes hearts and actually helps us act out in an actually broken world. So I'm very excited about this conversation today. I hope it's an encouragement to you and your family. And with that, let's get this conversation started. Welcome to the Gospel Tech Podcast, a resource for parents who are feeling outpaced and overwhelmed as they raise children in a tech world. As an educator, parent, and tech user, I want to equip parents with the tools, resources, and confidence they need to raise kids who love God and use tech. Thank you to everyone who has made this podcast possible. So if you are not aware yet, I want to let you in on this. Uh, Flint and Iron is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our number one ministry right now is Gospel Tech. And it is entirely donor supported. So the fact that you are able to listen to this podcast right now is because someone else saw the purpose of this ministry and they donated money, or maybe you donated money. And we are so grateful for that. So thank you to the donors who have made this possible. Uh, in a couple of weeks, you're going to hear us talk about Patreon, and we're going to be asking you to join us missionally, um, basically so that everyone has buy-in and that allows us then to go out and reach more people. And the second way you can support us is by making sure you rate and review. If if this has been a helpful podcast, please leave us a five-star review. If it is not five-star material, please send us an email or a direct message. It's nathan at gospeltech.net or directly to at lovegodusetech on either Facebook or Instagram. And I would love to hear how we could continue to improve, or if you have a five-star review, I'd love to hear how this is helping you. Um, and so those are just basically the big ways you can help us. It helps other people find out about us. So thank you for helping this project work and help us reach other people with hope in the gospel in, a, in kind of a crazy tech world that we're currently living in. Final thing I want to touch on before we jump into today's conversation is the Gospel Tech Framework Workshop. So we have created a handbook, Anna and I have created a handbook uh, that families can walk through together. The first half is the big picture questions. What is the gospel? How does it apply to our tech? How do I know if our tech is healthy? What can I do? Today's conversation. What can I do? It's all in there. And then with the handbook, there's these little short videos that you get access to. Uh, and then there's the second part is how do we actually make a tech framework? What ground rules do we need to think about? Which we're going to talk about today, but it's much more applicable. There's a reason we printed it in a book. Uh, it's it's wonderful. We are excited about it. The families who are using it are really excited. It's intended to do in like a small group or a community. Yeah, that can be a small group as small as your family or multiple families together. We are on this journey together. No one has all the answers. And as we pray through it, the Lord will reveal to us, hey, here's, here's how you can turn your hearts back to me. And that's what we want. So if you're interested in that, you can go to gospeltechworkshop.com uh, and you can check that out. Uh, yeah, that's where it is. So with no further ado, let's talk about this idea of, all right, what do I do about my unhealthy tech? I've done my reset. I'm aware of where I'm at. So what now? And to start us with that, I want to start with kind of the biblical foundation for this conversation. The first is that we serve and love a God who, or if you don't know God through Jesus Christ, here's the promise for all of us, is that we can have new hearts. We see, read out of Psalm 51.10. I love this. David has just absolutely blown it in his life, okay? This is something that is going to haunt him the rest of his life. It's actually going to cost him his first son. Uh, but he prays, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that promise, or that request, I guess, is 
repeated as a promise later by God when we have Ezekiel 36, 26, right? He promises that I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put into you. I will remove your heart of stone from from you and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, And the beautiful part about that combination is David recognizes, right? Man, my heart is stone. I don't, I don't love God. Like, look at this evil I just did. This is the Bathsheba thing. If you're not familiar with the story, he basically slept with his best friend's wife and then would later proceed to murder his best friend to try to get rid, get away with it. Uh, that, so that's a low point. He's not being hypothetical here, right? This is, this is a bad situation and he's crying out, God, I don't like it. I'm not okay with it. Help my heart because I can't help myself. Then Ezekiel, speaking from God's perspective to Israel, but is later revealed to be a whole family of God promise, uh, that this is what God is going to do with his Messiah. I'm going to take out your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And we see that repeated in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Right? That we are not hard-hearted individuals, and we didn't become soft-hearted because we tried hard enough or we did the right things. We became soft-hearted because God gave us a new heart. And with that new heart, we grew to hate our old selves, and we grew to hate our sin, and we grew to hate our own strength and begin to love and find so much joy in God's strength and God's goodness and recognizing everything we do on our own just hurts us more. And everything God does for us is for our betterment and for our good and for the love he has for us, right? Which is an infinite, never-ending, never-giving-up love. I know this is something I tend to kind of blow past in my own life. So I do just want to pause right here and say, friend, if you are not feeling joy today, uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're finding that the stressfulness of the news we're receiving about our nation or the people handling that news about our nation or whatever it might be from an external source, your work, your family, your kids, uh, maybe it's an internal thing. It's your past failures, your current failures, the future failures you have planned but haven't acted on yet. Uh, Whatever those are that might just be driving you into the dirt, uh, the Christian walk is not about simply being happy. It's not about living your best life now. Uh, in fact, this is our worst life ever. Like as long as Christ is true, this is as bad as it gets. Uh, it's only uphill from here when we go into the arms of Jesus. And so what we then do is we have to turn our hearts over. This is a regular thing. This is that that discipline of quiet times or whatever Bible study or whatever you want to call it. But we have to quiet our spirits and we have to abide in Christ. And that's a physical action. So when we talk about this first step of, our, all right, I can get a new heart. What does that mean? It means you leak that you are a sinner, and when you become saved in Christ, you don't magically become good. You're not Jesus. Uh, You become a healed person who is still sick uh, and will not be fully whole until that good work is completed in you in Christ when you step through the veil and you see God face to face, right? So in between now and then, if you're like me, there are some dark days. Uh, There are days where I'm just not up for whatever, feeling nice to people. And so I have to take that feeling and acknowledge it. I can't just hide and go, no, I'm a Christian. I love people. No, sometimes I don't. God loves those people though. And I can ask God for a new heart. So I hope that that's a good reminder for you because it's one I need to hear that it's not about every day is going to go well for you. It's not about every day you're going to have the right heart. It's when you don't, there's an option, right? What do we do with that option? Well, this is where the second part comes through for our biblical foundation is that we remove anything that causes us to sin. The verse I'm using for this, it was specifically talking about actually lust. So Matthew 5, 29 through 30, Jesus is going through the Beatitudes, and then he starts the Sermon on the Mount where he starts escalating all of the Old Testament law. And he's like, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm going to tell you, if you've ever lusted in your heart, you committed adultery. Like, And how are we ever supposed to get to the kingdom of heaven if that's now the standard? And his whole point is you can't. Following those rules didn't make you good enough, right? That was just so that I wouldn't have to smite you because I'm so righteous. I'm so good. So this is what we're saying. God's righteousness is so great. You have to have a savior, right? That's what this 5, 29 through 30 is talking about. And then that is a beautiful application of the rest of us because some of us, lust isn't our thing. It's anger, right? Or it's escapism or it's whatever, uh, arrogance and pride or success or whatever that thing is for us. Jesus is saying, if that thing causes you to sin, means it puts your hope in something other than me as your way to God, that's sin and it's keeping you away from God. And that means it's keeping your joy away from you and it's keeping your hope away from you. And you're going to get weighed down and crushed by it, cut it off, gouge it out, right? Go without whatever it is that's causing you to have these problems because life without that thing, as difficult as it might be, is going to be better because you're going to have more of God. 
And that's really the point of gospel tech, right? Is that we're not just trying to get less tech. We're trying to get more God. And we only remove the tech that's in the way. Whatever gets in the way, though, tech is fully expendable. Whatever that is that would get between us. So the first thing is we're going to ask for new hearts. The second thing is we're cutting off, we're gouging out whatever gets between us. And the third is this beautiful promise, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, if you just take this, you go, well, if I did enough right things, God would love me. False. While we were still sinners, God loved us and then sent his son for us so that we could become children of God. So while we were still sinners, God loved us, okay? Christ died for you and for me while we were enemies of God, full-blown treason, stating our own kingdoms and saying, we don't need you, God. So then what does this mean? Well, if we've had changed hearts, right? The building of the house doesn't rely on your and my wisdom. This is specifically saying as you'll hear in a minute, um, that the house that's built doesn't rely on the quality of the builder, but on the quality of the foundation. So built his house on the rock by doing what God says. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and the great and great was the fall of it. So if we reflect this onto our faith, Jesus is pointing out, again, on the rock versus on the sand, the builder got to put that faith, put that house on something, but it wasn't about the strength of the builder. It, was, it wasn't the quality of the ingredients of the house. It was the quality of the foundation. And Jesus is saying, when I've changed your heart, yeah, you do get some action in this. It's simply going to be, are you going to act on the foundation I've given you, or are you going to run to your own foundation? And people with tech, this is the point, right? With our technology, are we going to run to the foundation of Jesus and say, Jesus, you've changed my heart. That means that it should change where I go online. It should change who I talk to online. It should change how I pursue this as a priority in my life, what time of day I'm on my technology, who I'm around when I'm on top, everything, what I watch, what I listen to, what I play, all those things are now going to be funneled through the hope of the gospel, right? Does this help me see God more clearly or does it distract me from who God is and what God has planned for me? That is now my way forward and that is going to be my firm foundation or my sand. And when the house collapses on me, I can now run back to Christ and ask or I can blame God and say, hey, you didn't do this for me, right? I'm super upset. Now I'm now I'm mad at you, God, because things didn't go my way. And I'm I'm saying that in a rather jocular way, but many of us have things that went bad in life, really big bad things, And some of those things we caused, some of those were caused by others, some of them were just caused by a broken world, but we often put the blame on God and say, well, God, why didn't you? And he's actually saying, no, listen, here's what I've already done. Hope, even in that situation, is available today, and it's only available through Jesus. Give him your heart. Let us make it new, right? God wants to make your heart new. And um, yeah, and that's, I said, let us, and I... And going back to the singular plural of us that God would use, let us make a man in our own image from Genesis, right? This idea that God is three in one. So I just, for those of you listening for uh, ongoing any heresies, I do want to clarify triune God. It's mind blowing. All right, moving on. Uh, so we have this, the idea that we're kind of pulling into the culture with this picture of, of a new heart and cutting off the bad stuff and uh, turning back to God and doing what he asks us to do is this idea that if we don't prioritize our lives, someone else will prioritize it for us. Uh, a great Greg McCowan quote from the book Essentialism. And we're going to kind of run with that as our as our feature as we go in here, because the first thing we need to do, if I know my tech is unhealthy, when I listened to last week's podcast, or I've read the framework workbook or handbook, and I uh, I now know my tech is unhealthy in these areas, what do I do? The first thing I have to do is I have to have a tech framework. Right? I need to have expectations in, in really six areas, and the first is ground rules. My family needs to know, here's what the gospel says about who you are. Here's what we walk in every day. This isn't just a list of rules. We're not just going to check off a bunch of right and wrongs. We're going to say, all right, does this help us become more of who Jesus has asked us to be? Are we building our lives on the right foundation? We've got to have a gospel foundation, and we have to have a way that applies to our family. Framework's going to help us do that. Then we go, all right, in light of that, What time are we giving to tech? Where is our tech going to be? The time, the place, content, priorities, and safety, okay? Basically, we're helping our kids think through and we are modeling for them what technology looks like in our daily life. 
And that's what Proverbs 22, 6 is all about, right? You are raising your children up in the way they should go. So the first thing we're going to do is build a tech framework. That's where the gospeltechworkshop.com piece comes in. There's a little handbook, short videos, and that actually makes you the uh, director of that, I would say. I'm trying to get away from saying the expert because you don't need to be an expert. Uh, You know your kids, you love Jesus, and you have the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to give you some tools to talk. Right, I'll give you some talking points, and you can run with it from there. And that's that's the beauty of that. The second thing we're going to do is actually do what Matthew five twenty eight through thirty says to do. We're going to remove unhealthy tech. So I've found that when talking about technology, many of us have the wrong metaphor. We often think in terms of our technology of like, well, it's not killing me, or I'm not hurting anyone, therefore it must be fine. Like I could be doing something worse is the arg- argument we often take. And while that's true, I would argue that's the wrong metaphor. We're thinking, well, it's not a mortal illness, therefore I don't care. But coming from a a household with a father who is an orthodontist growing up, let's let's actually compare this much more accurately. Uh, A metaphor would be a cavity, right? None of us have a terrible cavity and then go, you know what? Sure, it's painful and it damages my quality of life and I could fix it super easily like today, but I'm just going to deal with it because it's not going to kill me. (laughs) Like, no, like anyone who's had a toothache knows like this is awful. It's awful for everyone you're around. It makes everything that used to be enjoyable, terrible. You can't really think or focus or read or sleep well. Like your life is in complete ruins until you get that tooth taken care of. And it can happen really easily, right? No one should live with a toothache. And by the way, a note on toothaches, um, they get significantly worse before they get any better. Like at some point, it might kill off the root and not hurt anymore, but it's probably going to abscess before that. And if you don't know what an abscess is, it's gross. You can YouTube it if you really care. But the idea is it's going to rot. You can die from that. It can poison your blood. You can get sepsis. It's a horrible thing, okay? So don't live with a tech cavity, right? Don't live with this thing that is driving your life further away from what God has intended for you, and it's making you unhealthy in the process. So just think about that reset we talked about last week. And if you have at least a one out of five, you have some kind of tech cavity. You have this little bit of rot going on in your tech life, and it won't get better by ignoring it. Okay, the rot is there. It's real. It's got to be dealt with. It can be dealt with really quickly. So let's talk about how we can do that. How do we get those tech cavities out of there? Uh, And I think the first area, let's just look at some examples. So social media, there's really four kinds of drool tech. Almost all of our tech cavities are going to have to do with our drool tech. Generally, the tool tech cavities have other heart issues going on, right? Like pride or uh, ambition or uh, a desire for money or finding our identity and success, right? Like those kinds of things or just flat out fear. But those are not things I can deal with when dealing with gospel tech. So let's talk about the tech side. There's four kinds of drool tech, social media, music, shows, and gaming. Those are the four main categories for where our drool tech would uh, would come from. So in the area of social media, I had a young lady who struggled with healthy phone use. Uh, she actually was in class and had a really bad habit with checking her phone to the point where she one day she was using Snapchat. She checked her phone. I caught her in the middle of checking it. I was like, hey, please put that away. He's like, okay, I just have to write back to this friend real quick. I'm like, no, like put it away right now because if I let you just get back to one message, I have 34 other students that all want to get back to just one message. And if you all do that every five minutes, we're going to have some serious issues on our hands, right? Like put your phone away. Don't check it. I'm sorry you saw a friend wrote you, but that's not the problem now. The problem now is you're on your phone instead of doing work and everyone around you sees you and goes, man, I have someone I want to message too. And this was too much right? She broke down. She started crying. This was at the point when Snapchat had this feature they just developed called being left on red, which basically was a read receipt. So you just send someone a message. It would show them that you hadn't checked their message, but hadn't responded. And friendships literally ended over leaving someone on red for too long. Thanks, Snapchat, for nothing. It's a wonderful behavior modification tool they use, though. That's that's clever uh, marketing right there. But the premise was she was so stressed out about this that she broke down in tears in the middle of my classroom because I'd asked her to do her English work. Now, think about that. What what would a loving family do? What, what do we look like in the in terms of tech framework and using the gospel as our foundation? Well, the first thing is we got to review our tech framework, right? What does it look like to separate our phone from our identity, right? What, why is leaving my phone behind so stressful? What about that is making me feel so anxious that I start to cry? And then as a part B of that, if I have friends who I am so scared of 
that if I don't write them a message during my class, which by the way, this friend was also in class. If I don't respond to them during class, they're going to be mad at me. Like maybe we need to talk about what it means to be a friend and to love others and to choose their good over our own. Like maybe that is something we talk about with our kid as well and say, hey, maybe this person doesn't actually love you. Maybe this person's just using you to feel good about themselves or to boss you around because that feels like emotional manipulation, right? And an emotional abuse is a real thing, especially in young dating relationships. We want our children to be aware and to be loving and kind and love people enough to say, hey, I'm going to walk away. This is an unhealthy situation. Here's my expectations for loving. I love you. And I love you enough to not allow you to make this normal in our relationship, okay? Um, so when we talk about our our examples for maybe social media, this young lady needs some time parameters. She needs some real-life friends to connect with, and she probably doesn't need a smartphone. Smartphone seems to be a bit over the top for her for where she's at health-wise and focus-wise. She needs an opportunity to really develop who she is as a young person, and that would be a wonderful application of unhealthy tech looking at it through the lens of the gospel and what God says about her and goes, all right, in light of this, smartphone is too much. That friend is probably an unhealthy place to be. And we love you so much. We're going to give you these other opportunities to connect with people and to stay engaged and be as academically successful as you can. And it's not just social media, right? Let's look at video games. I had a family who realized that while they played video games together and that was part of their rhythm, that that was kind of becoming the main thing they did, right? Especially the father and son. And so over Christmas break, uh, they ended up investing in a year-long subscription to board games. And so once a month, what they decide is, hey, once or yeah, once a week, what they're doing is they are playing a board game together. And once a month, they signed up for a subscription to get a new board game just sent to them. Sort of like the stitch fix of board games. You fill out a profile and then they, based on that profile, send you one game a month. And then once a week, they get together in the evening and they play a game together. And what they've said just in the first couple of weeks of doing this has been, so it started with Christmas, so it's, I think, been going on the third week, is that the conversations they have from a board game, which is just as trivial as a video game, right? But the conversations are much more human and engaging because the video game is no longer the focus. It's not the thing feeding you the reward and the excitement. The people are actually generating the excitement because they're what drive the board game forward. Uh, and that was a really cool way to do that, I thought, as as a family looking and saying, hey, we like video games, the games we play past what we say is, is healthy for our family, but we recognize that well, the girls kind of do their own thing. They're not doing connecting together. And while the boys are playing video games in our family, it's not really the highest quality. Like we can do, we can do less. And what I love about this specific solution is it took what the family was interested in and it made it more approachable for the whole family, right? It slowed things down and it didn't remove all games. It's something that every family can do. You and I could both pick one day this week where we go, you know what? We're going to pick an intentional activity our family will enjoy and we're going to do it together away from digital technology, away from distractions, and we're just going to enjoy each other's company. Make a meal, play a game, go on a walk, like whatever that might be, do a painting, like whatever your family's into, weld something. I don't mind. Uh, but the idea is pick something your family would enjoy and make uh, it intentional to do together. Uh, so the third area then would be music. And when we look at what does it look like to remove and then to replace in uh, unhealthy tech for music, we can't just go off, well, do I like it? So I had a young man who loved rock music and his parents were not into it. And when I asked them, well, what is the problem with his rock music? Because there are real problems available in rock music. They said, well, we don't like how it sounds. Now, that's not the best way to know. So I would say the first thing is refer to a family framework. Do the lyrics, does the music itself line up with your expectations for your hearts and minds in Christ, right? If it does, then we go to a reset and we go, all right, in a reset, does this impact any of your areas? Is this healthy for you or is it changing who you are? And if that's not part of it, right? Uh, if, if, if the heart is not changed, this kid is still healthy, still loves God, is still being active in the family and has not morphed into someone else while they're listening to this music. Uh, and it lines up with Philippians 4.8, right? It's true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. It's excellent and praiseworthy then that music is probably fine, right? Unless there's some third kind of kill switch button where uh, where you're like, hey, that is like a deal breaker for us. Uh, but we do want to recognize that in our music, so for this young man, his parents, can, he loved music. He wanted to be around the best music and the best musician, specifically he's a drummer. And a lot of rock music has incredibly talented drummers. Now, are there negative parts of rock music? Absolutely. 
Um, but they couldn't point to a reset part of his life. Now, if they could, they said, hey, his attitude changes every time he listens to this music. He becomes disrespectful. He becomes sullen. He becomes depressed. He talks about how he doesn't care about others or himself, right? Like, I've seen that. I've had students who walk into a room and be like, man, I can tell what was on your AirPods right before you walked in this door because <laughs> they'd listen to music in the hallways and they would just come in grumpy and sullen and angry. And five, 10 minutes into class, they'd level out. Right, And then they'd put their AirPods back in and listen during passing period or during lunch. And you can watch it impact their hearts and it refocuses their brains. And that is a real thing. So families do know that music is real. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And if it's stealing some of your kids' hope and joy, it might too, be too much. So replace it with other music, by the way, that fits their love and passions. Uh, don't just make them listen to Sandy Patty just because she says she's got Christian music going on. Uh, and if you haven't listened to Sandy Patty, please go and listen to it. It's delightful. Uh, the fourth one would finally be in shows. And as we're looking about uh, reflecting in our own lives, parents, what shows are we watching? We don't get some kind of magical free pass because we're quote unquote adults, so we can handle it. That's not true. If it doesn't line up with our family framework, it's too far for fun. We don't do that, okay? We trust that God is going to allow us joy still. He's still going to help us have amazing fascination at the world he's made, be blown away at the incredibleness of his giant world and universe and his incredible love for us. We don't have to drum up our own excitement. Keep that in mind. Because when we talk to our kids, a lot of our kids, uh, specifically coming out of older elementary kids into middle school, they start wanting to watch new shows, right? Like I've been watching Daniel Tiger since I was four, right? I've seen too many of these other shows with my siblings. Now my friends watch these shows. I want to jump into it. Well, the first thing we got to do is have those conversations with them. Does this line up? Like As a teacher, I could watch it go in phases. So like I had the whole Twilight group of kids come through. And within like three years, all of a sudden the Harry Potter kids started coming through, uh, which actually had a couple waves. Harry Potter like made another big push like five or six years later. Uh, But you had these kind of groups of kids who would be really excited about it. And your conversation needs to be with your child. Doesn't line up with our family expectations based on the gospel. Does it hamper your reset? Does it hamper who God's made you to be? And if not... Is this then something you can engage in how much and what should that look like? Uh, because in in my mind, the one that I always note for kids is they would generally start testing out the world of anime, Japanese animated cartoons. And the tricky part for parents with anime is it there's really innocent, awesome stuff like My Neighbor Totoro. And it's this giant cat that lives next door and has these magical experiences. Really cool. But it looks almost identical to something like Princess Mononoke, which could be cool for an older kid or an adult, but it gets pretty dark. Like there's just some dark themes, tons of gore, uh, kind of random spirituality stuff in there. There's like some neo-paganism stuff. Like it's just kind of odd. And you're like, I don't know, kind of feel like I have to take a shower afterwards. And that looks almost identical to stuff that you should never touch. In no way is it redeemable. It's not helpful. It is just generally going to destroy your mind and heart. And it's not uplifting. It is not Philippians 4.8. And as an adult looking from the outside, if you've never watched any of them, they look almost the same. The art style is similar. The animation is going to look similar. You'd actually have to get into it and go, well, what's in here? What are they talking about? Um, What is this doing? So as adults talking with our kids and setting up these areas for technology, we want to acknowledge in shows, there are some wonderful shows to watch. Not all of them are worthwhile. And that specifically in middle school, I, I just use that as an example. That genre of anime is one that's really convoluted. And rather than trying to inform yourself on every anime out there, you can instead drill down back to the gospel as it applies to your family, that framework, uh, and then start going, hey, is this is this acceptable? Is this praiseworthy? Is this good? Um, and if it's not, we know. And if it is, if it's fine, then we go, all right, does it impact you, though? It might be fine, but it still isn't healthy for your child, right? And that's the conversation we want to have with our kids. Yeah, I see that you love this, but you also obsess over it. Like, is there a way we can help you not have it impact your emotions or your enjoyment or your relationships or your sleep, right? Or your time? Like, you're just never satisfied with the amount of time you get there. Um, and so that's kind of our our piece on, well, what do we do? We remove unhealthy tech. So in that case, if there's a show that's unhealthy, you take it away and you can replace it with a more healthy show, unless the whole genre is just too much and they fixate on the whole thing. But I want the takeaway from this to just be that reminder that what we're talking about here is, all right, I recognize my tech is unhealthy. What can I do about it? And we return right to what God tells us in the Bible. And the first thing is, 
our change isn't going to come from us. We have to turn our hearts back. So parents, be praying for your kids. Pray for them daily, even when they seem like they're awesome and fine and amazing, because they're still broken kids in a broken world. We're going to ask God for new hearts for ourselves so we can love our kids like Christ loves, loves us. We can lay down our lives for our children, husbands like we are doing for our wives daily, and parents like Christ does for us daily, like Christ does for his church. And so we want to we want to live and love uh, in that sacrificial way, then we're going to remove those things that cause us to sin and that we see causing our children to distance from God, and we're going to uh, help actively walk out the process of building our house on the rock, right? That the foundation is what matters. So it's not about parents do this right the first time or else. Like, you're going to make mistakes. Your kids are going to make mistakes. The foundation is what matters, not nailing this every time. So build that tech framework uh, remove the unhealthy stuff and replace it with stuff that is healthy, right? Stuff that is going to help them uh, enjoy and love God. And out of that, what you're going to see is you're going to have joy in Christ. You're not going to be distracted by your technology or be living for it. Instead, it's going to be an extension of God's love for you. And all the amazing stuff you get into and all the things that blow your mind and get you excited are going to be able to redirect to get more people excited and engaged, right? Like they're going to be social. They're going to be outpouring because um, they're going to be life-giving, I guess is the way I'm trying to say that. So I hope this conversation has been encouraging to you. I hope that as you listen to it, you can hear, yeah, I know now what I can do if my tech isn't healthy, right? I know how to assess it. I know how to kind of have that conversation, but now you have that next step, right? You know that you can build a family tech framework and that it's not just so you have the right rules. It's so that the gospel goes from a lot of good ideas to actual practical application, like, what what do we do, husband and wife, let's figure it out. What do we do if God indeed changes us and gives us new hearts? Like, are we living in light of that? Do we need to repent about the way we've been handling this and then move forward in that? And if so, please do. And if not, take that next step of, all right, like we've repented and we're living fully right before God with our technology. How do we extend that to our kids? And we do it with grace. We do it with intentionality and with the mindset of, child, you're not mine to control. You're not a problem to fix. You are a child of God in light of what Christ has done for you. So they can put their faith in God. And if they don't want that relationship with God, that doesn't somehow tie your hands. Like Your child does need to make that decision for themselves. You, unfortunately, don't get to pick that. But you get to show them what God's, God's love looks like. You don't get to be the authoritarian ruler um, of justice that Jesus will be, right? When he comes back and rules and is the light of the new creation, that's not you. That's Jesus. Uh, so what you get to do is show what it looks like to intercede for somebody and to love that kid uh, even when they don't love themselves, right? To choose their highest good and to not make the easy path easy, right? Your job is to be in their life and to continue to love them and remind them and they can walk away, but that doesn't affect how you are going to be pursuing them, right? Because you get to be the hands and feet of Christ uh, in that kid's life. So um, that is my hope for what you heard in this conversation. Uh, I hope it was encouraging for wherever you're at in your tech journey. You might have six-year-old, you might have a 26-year-old, but uh, in that process, I hope that you can see, man, this is how I can love my kid today. This is how I can ask God to change my heart because it's only out of our changed hearts that this is going to work. Uh, and I hope you hear that Ann and I are very much in the thick of this, both with our kids, two, five, and seven, uh, and in ourselves. Like This is a regular ongoing battle that we go through of how do we use our tech well? How do I not pursue the easiest jolly, right, of going and scrolling meaninglessly just to get distracted or watching that show because life is stressing me out too much, but to watch a show because it's enjoyable and to turn my stress and my hope and my fears to to God in Christ uh, and to ask for him to renew me because he's always faithful to do that. So remember that today, friends. Remember God is always faithful to renew us when we need it and to listen to our prayers and give us the strength we need to love him and others more. So if you have any questions or any comments on this, uh, you're welcome to reach out. You can reach me at Nathan at gospeltech.net, or you can direct message us through social media, which is at Love God Use Tech. Um, and that's, it doesn't, caps don't matter. So just Love God Use Tech all together on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you so much for listening to this. And I look forward to talking again next week as we work through how we can all love God and use tech. <laughs>